So first and foremost, uh, good morning, good evening, and uh, good afternoon to everybody who's on here. We have folks coming in from different parts of the world at this second panel that we're uh, conducting at ISB. The first one was done last week with uh, Krish, who is the group head of HR from Infosys. Uh, Richard Brecky was a previous KPMG CEO of India, and uh, Stephen, who is the current regional leader at Hydrogen Struggles. Um, so today, it is absolutely my pleasure. Uh, I have a distinguished panel here to talk to you today. Um, I'd like to start with a brief introduction, and each one of them are truly interested in building what I call is the next generation of leaders. So with that, I'd like to just say, um, Manoj and I have worked officially over the last couple of years, uh, and it's been a pleasure working with such an empathetic and uh, humble leader. And if you look up his LinkedIn profile, which I'm sure you have, you know him by name, I think his achievements and what he's done in the broader corporate structure, government sector, as well as at the individual level is, is goes far beyond what any of us have ever aspired to achieve. So Manoj, uh, humbly I'd say thank you for joining us today, but would love if you could just do a 30 second introduction of yourself also. Thank you, Astik. Uh, I think it's more important to uh, share with them what I'm doing now and what I expect to do in the next five, 10 years. So I'm managing uh, a 15 billion portfolio of SoftBank Group and SoftBank Vision Fund. We have more than 20 companies, all are digital AI-led companies like Paytm, Oyo, Ola, uh, Lenskart, Delivery, Policy Bazaar, Grofers, Swiggy, Flipkart, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And, and we focus on technology, we focus on large digital transformations, and that's our focus and that will continue for last for next many years. I, I support the founders and CEOs to scale up the operations uh, by 10x, 20x, or even more. And that is where I think promoters, uh, founders, and CEOs need my help. So that's what I do. Thank you. And thank you, Manoj. And I think that's very relevant, right? Because if you think about um, the, the new crop of leaders coming out, they're coming out with entrepreneurial mindset and really thinking about how do we drive that 10x. So we're looking forward to hearing your thoughts. Um, and um, Anne and I, I have to say, go back a, a good almost 20 years now. Um, I, I am going to embarrass you. Anne was my first boss uh, out at Mercer when I got into the real consulting environment. I switched from one company to the other, and, and you probably don't know this, but in the company that I worked for before I joined Mercer, I had about 500 billable hours a year. And when I joined Mercer and worked for you, that in the first year went up to 2,100 billable hours. So regardless of what, uh, I, I, I will say that was a wonderful start. And I've known Anne for many years, an avid traveler. Um, she will probably also, you can go and look, look up her LinkedIn profile, but Anne, could you also do a quick introduction after I've perhaps in, uh, embarrassed you a little bit over there, but hopefully not. <laughs> no, thank you, Austic. It's been a great 20 years and I'm, it's such a pleasure for me to be here. Nice to meet you all. I, I was in your shoes studying um, business, but I, I combined um, business with psychology and that's how I ended up in the career that I'm in now, which is leading people in organizations. And no offense to my panel members who are in technology and finance, but I find the people part of the business to be one of the most complex um, pieces to really get right for organizations. And so I've dedicated my career to people in leadership development and trying to get the organizational dynamics right for companies to succeed. So in my HR leadership roles, I've spanned across a few industries, um, advertising, uh, technology, and now I'm chief people officer for a mental health care company uh, based in London. So really nice to meet you all. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Anne. And uh, Rumi, uh, I've met Rumi very recently, but uh, as Rumi will tell you, uh, his background, obviously, you know, he's been at Barclays, HSBC, now at Quinox. Um, he will tell you some stories about campfires, perhaps, and uh, uh, I, I recently met up with him in Florida and in the sunny state of Florida. But of course, uh, Rumi, perhaps you could uh, do a quick introduction of yourself also. Sure. I think uh, it's always dangerous asking me to kind of talk about stuff that uh, I may or may not kind of venture into. Uh, but, but I think um, 
I, I kind of, I'll briefly touch upon my background. I mean, I uh, finished college in uh, India and then um, uh, joined a small, uh, or at that time, a pretty big uh, IT company, uh, worked with them as a fresher, and I moved, moved from India, I mean, about roughly 35 years ago. Um, and my, you know, uh, quest was nothing to do with anything, but find something that was interesting, adventurous for me. Uh, and that led me to finally through the Middle East into U.S. And I ended up joining a, a bank called HSBC. I'm a technologist as, at heart. Uh, that's all I've done. Uh, but I'm also one of those defective uh, uh, technologists who has a desire to be uh, multidimensional in that sense. I mean, I have many other interests. And my biggest achievement in my in my uh, eyes, is not about my career, but about the fact that I have always loved martial arts and I always wanted to open a martial arts uh, school. So I did. About five years ago, I opened one in, uh, in Florida. And the reason I share that is there are so many things that you can bring into your life that can add to your overall brand, which is what I know Ashtik is trying to kind of uh, get across to, to the team over here. And brand is something that you own. You know, I mean, I, I, I love it when I meet somebody and I can have an opinion about them. Uh, I hate it when I meet somebody and I walk away saying, I'm not really sure I kind of understand whether this person has A, B, or C in their DNA. So if, if, if there is one thing I tell my daughters all the time, it's build your own brand, build your own personality, have an attitude, and go forth and be brave in whatever it is that you want to do. So, uh, you know, everything else you can find on LinkedIn, but this part was just something that I don't think I'll put out there. Well, fascinating. Next time, Rumi, I meet you, I'm going to make sure I sit on the other side of the table because uh, I don't know about the martial arts part. But uh, thank you again to this uh, advisor, the, to my advisors, my mentors, my friends, colleagues, and to the ISB uh, group who's here. So we're looking forward to an interactive session today. Like I said, we will have some Q&A time in the end. But let me start off with it. Right? If you look at the headline of uh, this topic we're discussing today, we spoke about strengthening my brand. And the big question that I always get asked when we do these sessions at ISB, brand is normally equated to an organization, right? Nike has a brand, Hyatt has a brand. Right now we started asking the question, what is the brand that you individually have? And quite often I get this question, okay, so does that brand mean what I look like on LinkedIn or what does my, or when do I start posting? When do I start liking? And does that influence my brand? And listen, we're not gonna get into the social media part over here as relevant as it is. We wanna switch this to talk about, as Rumi was just saying, your brand to build your career to leave a legacy behind, to become a collective cohesive leader that can influence the outcomes as you move out of your MBA school. Sometimes when we do these programs at an MBA school, we'll have a conversation about, and, and I hope some of you remember this, the Monte Carlo approach, right? And technically you guys are absolutely amazing. You will spin numbers and tell me about the probability of the Monte Carlo approach of a product being successful and the risk of it not being successful and you'll blow the numbers away. But what we're saying is that is one thing, that's table stakes. The intellect, the technical details that you have is a given. Now what's gonna differentiate you? What's gonna help you step up? What's gonna differentiate you and help your team, your organization drive that 10X model? So that's the essence of today's conversation. So with that in mind, what I would like to do is start with a set of questions. Um, Manoj, if you don't mind, I'd pull you in here uh, with my first question. As we think about successful leaders, what are the characteristics which differentiate a highly successful leader today? Thank you, Asik. I think that's very, very important thing to know for these MBA students. And I feel that they should also know that leadership makes all the difference. Whether it is a country or a company or a family or a community, it's all about leadership. And in my view, the brand is what you contribute. If you have contributed very well, you have a great brand. If you haven't, you don't have a brand. 
so so the characteristics i believe which are important are three or four one is and the major one is courage i feel leaders need to have courage courage of conviction what they should do what they should not do when they should do it may be something which is very very different from what others are thinking but leaders should have their own instinct own strategic thought and that's where courage comes from second is which is also very important is that the eq part of a leader and i'm assuming that iq is already there because he won't be a leader if he doesn't have iq he or she doesn't have iq but i think in the years to come eq is becoming far more important uh empathy is becoming far more important and the softer aspect is more important for achievement of results and i think if leaders don't have that then for them to outpace competition and achieve superior results will be very difficult very difficult the third thing i want to share is discipline of execution leaders should know what is the discipline of execution because really uh, he or she will make a difference if the business executes relentlessly and that is that that is the hallmark of big leaders uh and 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 if they know how to discipline what is the discipline what is the process what is the way to achieve the best execution i think contribution will be fantastic last but not the least which is very important for the coming decade is the technology focus and technology understanding of leaders if they don't know how what technology is coming in in the next 3 to 5 years 10 years and they don't embrace technology they don't especially digital technology which is there but there's so many others which are coming in if they don't do it proactively if they don't do it personally i think leadership will struggle and i think the business will go behind time behind technology and competition will overtake so the point i'm making these are three four very core core characteristics of leaders which others may not followers may not have but leader needs to have as a prerequisite absolutely thank you manoj and if i can build on that i mean the technology is one part and then to your point on the people side there's execution there's empathy there's eq there's courage this goes exactly to your point on the people side the leadership side of the behavioral side of the business could you also perhaps give us some insights of what do you see differentiate a, a successful leader today yeah well that's i think manoj's response was exceptional i i was taking notes myself cuz i think that's a that great response but i think he's exactly right on the people side i mean i've seen it from first hand experience working with ceos in various organizations where that i've been a part of it's the ones who are really good at spotting great talent and surrounding themselves with a great team of um a diverse team with people with different skill sets different perspectives um each strong in their fields it, it makes all the difference and so to have the humility to surround yourself with that kind of talent is is uh part part of it requires EQ to like be able to really attract the people to work with you um who are really talented in in their domains and want to come work with you and keep them motivated um that's all about you know having the leadership qualities that we're able to attract and retain that type of talent around you and so i've seen organizations succeed where leaders have been able to do that because you know one day the leader is not there and they're supported by a really strong team that keeps the organization going and then i've seen the opposite too where they haven't had that team behind them and and things fall apart from one day to the next when the ceo steps out so I think leaders really need to have um a knife for talent and that's that is about um having EQ. I would also say just connecting what Minaj said to the the brand is we all need to have those characteristics that and qualities that Minaj said but bringing your own brand and personal style to it is is the key to we're all going to be different types of leaders and we can all lead it no matter what level of the organization we're at. but how how you bring your personal style to that is all about your values and how consistent you are in living the values that you stand for as a leader and um I'll leave it with that. <laughs> all right, thank you and uh, Rumi to pull you in. Could you build on that uh, what Manoj and I said and uh, do you have another point of view? 
So, so it's always interesting, right? When you're the last one on the podium, you kind of shake your head and say, yeah, I mean, you know, those were the things that, that, that I was going to talk about. And, and the good news is that neither Anne, Manoj, or I, or Rustic have had a conversation uh, to kind of figure out what we were going to say. We are kind of giving our honest uh, point of view. Uh, but, the, but the interesting thing to me is that we, we've kind of, I touched upon being brave. And one of the things Manu talked about was courage. Uh, uh, I had on my, uh, you know, when, when uh, Manoj was talking about uh, EQ, uh, I was thinking about the kind of individuals that one would like to work with. So I, I, I will kind of reset for a second. And rather than repeat what, what's already been said, I'll make a little bit of a controversial point of view uh, that I have seen. I mean, I worked with, uh, with various companies in about, you know, eight to nine different countries in my last 20, 25 years. Um, and I worked in very different cultures and in very different markets and, and environments, all of them with a baseline of technology and business that we were supporting, right? But the businesses were quite different. The cultures were quite different. And the leaders that were there, I've seen those, I've seen leaders who were highly successful in a very specific context, as an example, an m &A. You're going in there to do a, what I call an aggressive takeover of a company. You need a very different leader, leadership style that needs to percolate within the team for that specific mission. But then I've also gone and had to kind of resurrect uh, a, a company that had many problems for whatever reasons and the morale was completely in the, in the dumps. And you needed a very different leadership style to kind of re-invoke the, the emotions, the confidence in the team. Now, if I had just transferred one leadership style to another, I think it would have gone, you know, as they would say, like a fart in a church, because it wouldn't have worked. It would have been horrible. So I think you, as a leader, one of the, in my opinion, one of the most amazing things that you need to bring is to be able to read the room. You need to be able to know what is going on that requires certain style that would work best. So adaptability, uh, we all know that, you know, uh, you need a certain amount of attitude. You need a certain character, uh, charisma. And, and, and uh, at times, as I say, humor. You know, you can't always be thinking uh, that everything can happen through intensity. I used to do that. I mean, I, 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 I was told at times by my own daughters, Dad, you're too intense. And I kind of realized when you look at, look at the way I'm delivering a, 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 or, or engaging in a conversation, and if my energy is going to intimidate someone, then that's not really going to help the solve a problem. So you need to understand what style to bring, uh, build your charisma along with uh, your intensity, and you know, hold yourself to the highest standards. I have seen leadership styles where they talk about you know, the corporate values and they break every one of them. Uh, I mean, it really hurts me when, when people have an opportunity to make a significant difference to people, to other people, to organizations and to customers, and you yourself don't know how to walk the talk. So if you're gonna say something, follow through. If you're gonna ask people to kind of work hard, then be the first one at the office and the last one leaving. You cannot make, you cannot go out there as someone who has the, the responsibility to make change, talk about change and not be part of the change. So to me, you know, everything that Manoj and Ann talked about, I, I absolutely buy in, in uh, heaps. I think the world that we are going to inherit going forward is going to be very different from a talent acquisition perspective and, and uh, retention perspective. You cannot manage people the same way uh, people have been managed by some leadership styles. And some geographies have a very specific management style. I would suggest that you, know, you open up to look, and I always talk about being a global citizen. A global citizen is not someone that has been around the world 55 times. 
A global citizen is someone who understands what are some of the best practices and how do you kind of bring them into your DNA. So look at what make what should make you successful and then figure out where the gaps are and work actively on them. Asik told me no more than three to four minutes. So here I am. I think three and a half minutes. That was that was well timed, Ruby. I, I'm I'm gonna build on that. And Anne, if you don't mind, I'll pull you in on this. Um, we, we spoke about execution. We we're talking about a, a lot of what, what Rumi and Manoj spoke about was execution, right? Now, when you build this down into what should an MBA graduate do, right? They're coming into the workplace with a lot of technical knowledge, a lot of many of them will be in a some sense a consulting role. And, and when I work with them, I say whether you work for a consulting firm and I'm not going to name which ones or you go in as a product uh, manager. A big part of your role is consulting. And I know your and my heart and DNA is almost formed in that consulting world. This part of discipline of execution, how do you think uh, MBA graduates would look at this? What would make them contribute the most when they go into the workplace when it comes to execution? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. So I think that the biggest things that you can contribute, and we covered this before, which is everybody knows you're smart and you're coming in with a new tool set that maybe the organization you're joining has never seen before. And it's very valuable to them. Um, I think you're what you've learned in your education through just the rigor of, of breaking down a problem and getting through to a solution is something that I learned from my consulting days. Austic and I did it 20, 100 times over. Um, and that discipline is something I still bring to my work as an internal person. And it's something that served me very well. And that will serve you well, um, whether you're consulting, uh, consulting to an organization or whether you're in a role inside an organization, just that thoroughness of, of breaking down a problem and, and finding a process to a solution. So use that in spades. People will find that very useful. But I would also say, you know, and part of the EQ too is, is having a bit of humility. So just because you've, you've seen this process in your case work or in your studies, there are a lot of people around you in the organization who have much more experience in, you know, what the particular context of your company is, or they've tried things before they know haven't worked in your particular industry. Listen to them, keep an open ear. Um, and that's part of the consulting skill set, too, is just keeping an open ear, asking great questions, listening, taking all of those viewpoints in along with all of your education. And there you have a magic formula of if you can do both of those things, you you're going to bring a lot of value to the organization. Um, so I would, you know, try to avoid being a little overly rigor overly stuck on process Um be adaptable to the environment that you're joining and really listen and, and adapt um, to the to the environment around you, I guess I would say, is my advice. That's brilliant. I mean, I know a lot of the work that we do on the consulting side, when we when I used to teach consulting skills, it was this 80-20 rule, right? Do you speak 80% of the time or do you have your customers, your counterparts, your clients, your stakeholders? Try to engage them so they speak 80% of the time, right? So how do you manage that shift from me speaking 80 to the client getting 80% of the time, right? And it may not be exactly that, but that's a brilliant point. You've also captured something on humility. So Manoj, what I'd like to do is, if you don't mind, ask you this question and, and maybe double click and, and put you in a little bit of a challenging situation here. And the question is, yes, of course, where can MBA graduates contribute the most? But also, can you give us an example of where do you think the MBA part may derail them? Right? And sorry to put you on the spot on this, but I think it's, and it started that conversation, so I'm going to lead in with that. Manoj? Well, thank you, Astik. Uh, you know, thousands of MBAs have worked with me. And uh, the bad news I want to share with you is that majority of them, more than half, didn't succeed too much. And maybe half succeeded a lot, did well. So I felt that they are good at new business creation. Uh, in, the, in the startups I support now, I see many, many MBAs doing very well because it's a new business, it's a new culture, a new, it's very open, youthful. I think they've done very well. I think that is the area where MBAs do very well. And uh, that is why now I see 
the new startups are attracting many, many engineers and MBAs both. And a lot of young youth talent is going there. What they don't do well or why they do not succeed is very important. Uh, I find two reasons. One is that they look at business in a very structured way. Uh, they look at business in parts. They look at business function-wise. They don't look at business as a whole because MBA really segments the business very precisely, which is, which is okay for, to understand the parts, but you need to understand the whole also. So because of that, they do over-analysis and their focus on being hands-on and be action-oriented is lower than expected by their bosses. So I've heard many times my senior colleagues have come to me that, you know, he's MBA, but he's not, he or she is not focusing on, uh, on, on the real life. He's not taking actions. He's not, but he's doing excellent analysis, which is good. I think analysis is good, but more than analysis is how you transform that into real life action. And I think that is something which MBA need to, MBAs after MBA need to have that bias of action. The second thing, as I feel, which I had said earlier, is that because they're very, very smart and they do excellent analysis and they're good with numbers and intellectually strong, their respect for other colleagues, for the team, for guys who may not be MBAs, guys who may be middle level or junior level, is low. Now, whether it is a level of arrogance or ego or what, I don't know what, but Clearly, that pulls them down because in companies, especially in companies which are executing relentlessly, it is about team. It's about team performance, not individual performance. So you may be the smartest guy in the, in, in the team, but if the team doesn't support you, you won't do it. You won't be able to do it. You won't execute well because the team will let you down because you are letting down the team uh, either through not being respectful or not being empathetic not being humble, which is most important for the team today. Teams work with humility, work with people who work uh, hand in hand, shoulder to shoulder. So these are a few things which MBAs, as they come out, I feel they should, they should try to be more close to the team and try to be more hands-on. Thank you. Much well said. I mean, I'm taking notes again here now, well, along with you, and so Rumi, to put you in here uh, on that question around, um, in your opinion, where do you think MBA graduates can contribute the most? And perhaps can you give us an example from your work, partly as HSBC across the world? Where have you come across a particular person that got derailed because of that uh, person? So I mean, I, I'm, I'm not going to say MBA or otherwise, because it almost seems like a title given by uh, the queen. Uh, I, I, I think uh, I, I'm one of those uh, individuals that have always respected people for what they do, not what they were supposed to do. So I think, you know, uh, first, don't take this title too seriously. I mean, you, you became an MBA because you were able to get go through a... a a course, you were able to keep up the pace, you were able to learn, and you were therefore rewarded for learning whatever it was that you were asked to do. Now, that does not change when you go into the workplace. You don't go into any job showing a piece of paper and saying, look what I was able to do in the rear view mirror. Nobody cares. You know, it's a zero sum game, uh, boys and girls, each and every day. You wake up in the morning, you start, you reboot the day. Nothing, nothing follows through from yesterday what you did. I mean, I don't wake up uh, this morning talking about what I did yesterday. I mean, today is a new day. We are having a conversation here about what tomorrow should look like. Well, in that case, you need to prepare today for tomorrow. But tomorrow, you're not going to be able to look back and say, but that's what I did yesterday. So... Get into the game. Uh, understand that you know being real is really, really important. Forget about preaching, pontificating, etc. You know nothing is more uh, off-putting than academic arrogance to anyone around us. So uh, 
uh, fortunately for me, I never had the uh, academia to boast about. Uh, I had to kind of roll up the sleeves and work hard with those IIT guys side by side and figure out how I was going to make a difference. So if you believe in yourself, go out there and grab whatever it is you want to grab. But that will require a lot of hard work and nothing happens uh, without sacrifice. So if somebody believes that because they have a piece of paper uh, telling the world that they have done something, that's great. They will get you in the room. But to now sit in the room, there are 20 other hungry people around you. You need to outpace them. And that only happens through hard work. That only happens through focused and disciplined output. And like I think Manoj or uh, Anne or someone mentioned, this academic arrogance, if that is at display, will completely destroy you. So I, I have seen it myself, uh, people who, who have had those kind of uh, uh, attitudes and they don't really carry very well in any organization. Uh, I would also say that, you know, learn to interpret ambiguity. You know, the world today changes at one of the fastest uh, pace possible. Uh, and in order to deal with ambiguity, you need something else. You need an attention to detail. Meaning if you really know your underlying foundational business, dealing with ambiguity becomes very easy. But if you are this fluff at the top and you only talk, but don't really know what the processes do, that is the reason one, one of the biggest failure points for leadership or for grad, MBA graduates or any other uh, uh, what I call highly qualified uh, academic person is that they are talking from a theoretical point of view. Life doesn't work on theory. Life works on shit that happens every day. Life works on changes that happen every day. And you need to be cognizant of what is making those wheels turn. If you don't know the, the nitty gritty of your business, if you don't understand the, the world of technology, and I said the world of technology just as Manod did, because today the world is going to uh, uh, live off that. You know, the, the world of AI that is kind of knocking at our doors is not just a theory. It's a reality. And what that's going to do is going to segregate the, the mundane tasks that, that happen, the number crunching, et cetera. That's going to get automated. And it's already automated. I think what is now required is how are you going to deal with those humans that are going to augment that reality, that, uh, that intelligence. And that requires a very different kind of uh, behavior. So uh, one other uh, thing that kind of pops in my head is, again, the art of communication, the ability to communicate effectively is so underrated. And I really think that people, uh, when, when they graduate with a lot of uh, these honors uh, about a domain or about a technology or whatever it is that they graduate in, if they're not able to kind of get around the table and effectively co communicate their point of view, what good is it? I mean, you know, you, you are, you're not going to be able to kind of make what I call uh, missionaries out of mercenaries. You know, if you, I, I have always believed that in life, you need to take one of two paths. You're either a missionary or you're a mercenary. And in my, you know, I grew up with uh, the, the missionaries uh, for 11 years in school uh, from, from Spain. And those guys drilled into me one thing, basics, ethics, hard work, discipline, go out there and conquer the world. But you require those other things that I said before in order to conquer the world. Beautiful. Thanks, Rumi. I mean, uh, listen, guys, some tough words of wisdom, right? But we wanted to make this panel real and give you a sense of what you're looking forward to, what will make, what will differentiate you, right? So let me build a little bit on what Rumi said. And Manoj, if you don't mind, I'll pull you in. Uh, we spoke about don't take the titles too seriously and these tough words of wisdom. When we think about with your MBA graduation or if you're the star or the sales star, right? Does that get you into the room? Does that get you promoted? Does that get you selected to the executive level? H how should you look at it? Is a sales star of yesterday necessarily going to become the executive of tomorrow? Any insights on what we spoke about? No, MBA 
I, I, when I, I feel very differently. MBA is just a degree. It yeah. doesn't get any badge on the chest. The badge on the chest comes from your actual execution contribution, which may take you six months, may take you one year. Sometimes some guys are slow. It may take three years, five years. So once you get a badge on the chest, let's say in first six months of working in a company and you make one achievement, only one achievement, which is significant and people notice you, they start noticing you, then people start trusting you. They start coming to you. They start building confidence in you. And they don't know whether you are MBA or XYZ. It doesn't matter, actually. It is the badge on the chest of a contribution. Once that badge is there, then you start building trust. And then you do the second good thing and the third good. And then, then it becomes your habit. And people also know that it is a good habit this guy has. He achieves many, many things. So it's very simple. And I, 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 I think MBA is just an education. That's all. I mean, it could be education like any other degree. But it's been bloated up too much. I'm also MBA, so I'm, I'm, I, <laughs> I feel that it doesn't deserve much of recognition. I think you have to do what you have learned. That is more important. So, Manoj, I, I'll build on that and then I'll pull you in in a second. I, I do think, I personally think from my point of view that an MBA does give you a certain way of thinking and a certain uh, linear, strategic, streamlined way of thinking, right? And if anybody tells you that was your MBA worth it, I would tell them to very simply buzz off, right? So it is absolutely 100% worth every penny and midnight sweat that you have put into it. Now, what, what the team is trying to tell you here is you have to go beyond that MBA, right? You need to go from there into how do you take the rest of the team along with you? How do you build on this, this holy grail word of trust? And that's where I want to pull you in, Anne. And this is not scripted again, so going with this. If I take an example of the trust that you and I have built over 20 years, I can call you tonight and I, hand on heart, I, I know that you may be on the next plane to come and help me out, right? A lot of that was built of trust. Now that's a personal relationship. How do you go about building trust in the workplace? What do you do? Is it, is it something, an activity that you do, something you build over time? What has worked for you to build trust with, with me, with others, with a lot of other network that you have? Yeah. It's a great question. Well, I think there's a few, there's a few things and it, of course it is critical to do this because you're going to be coming, many of you will be coming in alongside people perhaps in the same job who don't have the MBA background, but they, they have five years of experience background and you're all equals on this team. Um, and so, you know, you may be perceived as a threat, but you may be welcomed with open arms, who knows, but you have to build trust with those other team members and kind of create a level playing field. So how do you do that? Well, I think one, one thing is to be reliable. That's like sort of the great table stakes, you know, do be there, take on some tasks, take on your piece of even the grunt work that needs to be done and deliver when you say you're going to and with quality and be the person on the team that everyone can trust to get things done um, and pull your weight. Don't Nothing's below you. Um, you're, you're a member of the team. Um, and then I think you can be a help to your colleagues. So, you know, if you're the one who's leaning in to help others who may have a lot of work on their plate and you can help take that off their plate or help them somehow maybe teach them some of your skills and while you learn some of theirs and do it all with humility i think that's where you build the relationships and start to build the trust with your colleagues and i think that's how we built our exhaustic when didn't we when we were all working on the same team with our clients um uh we also built a bit of trust by maybe having a few drinks after work and building like personal relationships too, which are very important. Um, but all of that came together, I think, to build these, these trustful relationships. So it's that, that reliability, uh, leaning into um, doing whatever's required for the team, helping your colleagues, and then spending the time to build the personal uh, relationships. Absolutely. And, and to make this personal for the Rumi, you and I have spoken about a very, key part of what you tell people to do when the first time they go out and they may travel from India to Seattle or to Tokyo or to Singapore or to Sydney. And, and in this group, especially in your career, you will be global citizens. You probably will travel. 
to me, what should they do that first evening there when they go out? And I, I know I'm bringing out a personal advice you've given me also. No, I think I was just kind of relating that, you know, I used to, uh, by the way, you, you know, I love, I, I want to first go back to what uh, Astik said. I think academia uh, is important. I don't want anyone to walk away over here thinking that, you know, uh, getting a degree is not a good thing. Of course it is, uh, because it shows you, uh, it, it forces you to kind of acknowledge knowledge, you know, understand how knowledge is acquired, gets you into the habit and the discipline of studying. These are not things that uh, happen easily for everyone. And, as you, and you will find out as you grow older, or as you have already found out when you're older, that ability to kind of learn uh, at a focused pace is not easy. So I think it kind of gives you all of those uh, uh, blueprints that you can use. And I think what we are here to do today is tell you we've already traveled that path. But what, what we are now doing is traveling the path that you are going to travel upon and are kind of telling you what are some of the pitfalls that you may face and how you could avoid some of them, provided you are true to yourself, provided you kind of open up, look in the mirror and say, yeah, these are areas that I must kind of do something about. And we all have those areas. There is not one person sitting on this panel over here that has not kind of bettered herself uh, or themselves over the years. You know, I, I, I talk about my own demons each and every day to myself. And I need to know how to control those demons because they, they'll never go away. They'll be there in my DNA and they will stay with me, but I know how to control them. And I think each one of us need to be real about ourselves. So that would be my first, I mean, same advice that I give my uh, grown daughters who have been uh, through the same MBA course that I'm talking to over here. So, but I, I'll go back to Astik's question uh, or rather prompt to me. And at that prompt was that I had an amazing cadre of youngsters, brilliant, working for me in China, in India, in Brazil, uh, and you know, in Eastern Europe, in Czechoslovakia, in uh, Poland, Krakow, et cetera. And I used to kind of uh, send them on these consulting gigs, you know, to UK, to Hong Kong, to US, uh, and other places, because that's where they kind of got the real business sense, uh, because while they were sitting in these uh, factories where we were manufacturing, and I'm using the word manufacturing of software and content, unless and until you're facing the business pressure each and every day, you don't really know what goes on in the coal mines, what problems the sales guys are facing, what problems the operations guys are facing, or what problems customer service guys are facing, talking to customers each and every day. But one of the things I found was that they'd go to these uh, uh, business areas and they'd still be staying within their own little clique. You know, three of them go there. Uh, the three Brazilians go to the Brazilian restaurant. The four Indians go to the Indian restaurant or they go back home and uh, cook some stuff up. But the same thing. And I said, guys, you have to stop this. You, when, when you are sent there, you are sent for the whole experience. The whole experience means you're going, to, you're going to try out foods that you never were trying out when you were in your own country. When you're with a team of Americans or Brits or whoever or Aussies, you're going to go out with them for a drink. And by the way, you don't need to drink if that's not what you want. But you're going to buy a freaking round after they have bought you five Coca-Colas. It doesn't matter that you are not drinking, but you need to put up your hand and say, okay, the next round's mine. This is how you build empathy between people. But if you constantly strive to be different, guess what? You're gonna be differentiated by others. So don't be surprised when nobody then invites you to that uh, party that they are having in their backyard because you never showed any reason for them to engage with you. So, you know, I, I, I think, uh, and I, I want to kind of add to some of the things that Ann and Manu talked about, because I, I think that what gets you into the room, which is your background, your credentials of what you have done, doesn't keep you in the room, because in the room, you need to deliver every day. As I said, it's a zero-sum game. Wake up in the morning, 
start again. And I think if you get your men, uh, yourself in that mentality that I need to be delivering, you're going to figure out how to help somebody else. And I think there is a very big missing component in our selfish lives where we talk about, you know, what I'm going to do. But just ask the question, what did I do for somebody else? You know, did I help somebody else? Because that's what Anne was talking about, the trust component. That happens when you go and volunteer to help someone. You know, you know that one of your yeah, colleagues yeah. is having a problem. Yeah. Let me build on really what you said, especially on the learning piece over there, right? And, and this is the kind of as we get towards the end of today, and we, we will break for a Q&A over there. We hear about this buzzword of agility, right? And even in the role that I play at Hydric and Struggles, agility is a key form of what we look for in leaders of tomorrow, right? Which is their ability to adapt or foresight the learning and resilience. And I'd like to ask you, Manoj, when you look at agility today and given the context, from what Rumi said around the learning piece or even the foresight and how do you adapt, what's your point of view of the importance of agility for this next generation of leaders? Let me first, uh, Astik, take you through my experience in Airtel. We started that company with ground zero and took that company to 400 million customers. And our key ammunition was our speed. We surprised the market. We surprised customers. We surprised competition. We surprised government. We surprised sometimes ourselves. Now, how could we do so much? And, and I think that experience of such a huge scale up proved to me that agility will be the number one ability of a company to win in the next phase of a business across the world. Now, agility will come from two areas. One, it will come from technology because you need to digitize internally and digitize externally. Internally, all the functions, externally, all vendors, dealers, distributors, every stakeholder, so that it's all online. Nothing is offline. Everything is online. That brings speed of decision-making, speed of execution, speed of responsiveness to the market changes, and speed of hitting back at competition. That's very, very important. The second very important way of achieving higher agility is culture. It's about people, enthusiasm, people's passion, people's ownership of the brand. Like in Airtel, just to go back, uh, we had a we had a we had two 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 popular sayings. One is that I am Airtel, so employees should say I am Airtel. I do this as if I don't own the company. I don't. I'm not a shareholder, but I own it. I own the brand. When people look at me, they meet me. They feel this guy is Airtel. So that is one. Second is, uh, you know, their, their enthusiasm from that I want to win every day. So the slogan was win every day. And that win every day, and it's not about a week or a month or a year. It's about every day. Every day I come and I win it. And the day I don't win it in the marketplace, I am very upset with myself and my team. Why did it happen? Let me come back and do it again tomorrow morning. So the, the agility will come from a combo, very powerful combo of technology and enthusiastic culture. If these two, a leader can blend, I'm telling you that company is worth investing because that company will do the team proud, the, 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 the investors proud, and really move far ahead of competition. Thank you. So, and uh, to pull you in on this one, is, as you said in your introduction, a lot of this is really coming down to the individual, to the person, to the people side, even the culture of the business, right? Your point of view on culture, and, and not necessarily the organization culture, but when it comes to agility, culture, how does an individual contribute to that, right? We often see clients doing these large culture transformations, but how do you make it real with an individual? What can these leaders do 
when they go into an organization to drive that, whatever the cultural shift that they, they're part of. Yeah. Um, well, I, before I get into that, I just wanted to use a great example of agility in terms of just this last year and a half and what companies have had to do in the face of COVID. I mean, we don't know what the next thing is around the corner, but that was a tremendous um, opportunity for if you looked at it that way or disadvantage, depending on how you, how you manage it as a business. But it was a lesson in agility. And what we learned, I think, from that is you, there, no one had the right answer. We still don't know what the right answer is. It's all about experimentation, being willing to fail and try something else, being willing to innovate, being willing to do things the way we've never done them before. Um, and for everyone to be open-minded to that. And this time it was out of necessity. Um, but in it, that, that is kind of what culture is, right? It's about preparing people to look around the corner, be open for what's next. Um, I think every company is in the face of probably to, to speak to what Manoj just talked about. Every organization, every industry is undergoing tremendous tra digital transformation of some sort. And there's a competitive threat on the horizon. And so if you don't create a culture where people are agile, they're ready to embrace the future, you're, it's likely that you're sitting in a company in an industry that is going to be dead pretty soon. So being able to get every single individual on board with that mindset is hard, um, but it, it's, ne it's necessary, I think, for the leader of the future to be able to build an organization like that, because like I said, no matter where, what you're doing or what kind of business your company is in, you've got to be ready for what's next. Um, how do you do that? I mean, I, I think Rumi talked about it before, it's leading by example. So the messages come from the top, it comes, if you're going, I see a question here about going into mid-level or senior management roles. You're in a role where everyone's watching you. They're watching how you role model this innovative, this risk-taking behavior. Um, if you're doing it, they're going to follow. If you're not doing it, then it's all just words on the wall. So that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Well said. And, and Rumi, building in what uh, Anne said, and we're coming to about the last five or so minutes, I'd like to open it up. There's some very good questions in there that I'd like to pop open. But just uh, one thing from what Anne said, Rumi, as you look forward, right, we've spoken about successful leaders today. If you were to fast forward 2025, 2030, how do you think leaders will be different, right? Whether it's technology orientation, geopolitical, managing a multiple multi-generation workforce, how do you think leaders will be different in 25, in, I'm sorry, 2025 or 2030? Interesting, in, in, interesting uh, question. Something that uh, I think most people uh, in leadership roles have been thinking for a while. And I think to me, the biggest change that I see, I mean, uh, leave, leaving the te technological stack, which is going to evolve tremendously. I think I want to touch upon that in a second, but uh, to answer your question directly, I think talent is almost going to become, uh, you know, this concept of an employee, I, I personally be believe is going to get very disrupted. Meaning I have a skill, I can be available for multiple companies, to go and provide my services. It's almost like, and that is why I, I found this uh, session very interesting about building your brand. Yes, you're not a company as a brand, but guess what? I have a feeling you are going to be the company selling your brand to millions and billions of others to also surrounded by billions of other brands that are similar. So what are you going to do to differentiate yourself? Whether it is how agile you are or how disruptive you are or how uh, flexible you are, that I think is going to be the difference. I almost feel like there is going to be an auction that I can get up in the morning and say, you know what, I want to get an app developed. Uh, I'm willing to pay $5,000. I want it at the end of the day. Bid. I want to you know, or somebody's, or I'm going to go onto a marketplace where people are already offering their services, and I'm going to say I need an analysis done from this model that I've developed, and I want some data to be aggregated so that my model can work on and give me a result. A lot of these things, by the way, are happening, but they're not happening at massive scale. 
So what I'm proposing over here is building your brand now becomes even more critical, even more important because the, the pace for people uh, who are going to be required is going to be high, but it's not going to be for everyone. It, it, not everyone is going to get that bid. Not everyone is going to get selected. But I mean, it may sound futuristic, but that's how I see uh, really good uh, technical or domain folks being used. You know, consulting is, a, is an ever going thing. But my what I'm proposing here is that it's going to hit a very different high and a very different way of how we are going to get results uh, from the workplace. So if you, if you were to indulge me with my thinking, then you would kind of start looking at yourself much more seriously as a brand that you want to offer in the marketplace. Brilliant. Manoj, can I just pull you on on that last question around if you fast forward to 2025, 2030, what do you see successful leaders doing differently in terms of technology or innovation, geopolitical, or the ability to manage a multi-generation workforce? Thank you, Astik. Uh, so, so you are absolutely right. I think technology and geopolitical impact on business will be most important for any leader. I mean, these two, if you can manage and ride these two, you are on top of technology and top of geopolitics by understanding, etc. Then you are a king. But beyond these two, there are two more, which which I believe are uh, a very powerful combo for a leader to, to guide and shape the organization. Number one is innovative business models. I believe that leaders have to shape business models which are very different from the past, which are new business models, which are led by technology, which are led by how to reach to consumers faster with better product, with affordable price, Etc. I think across the world, I'm seeing innovative business models are critical for long-term success. And leaders have to lead it and have teams focus on this and, and really do it faster than anyone else in the market so that you win your first time right. The second area, which is not a new area, but, but will continue to be bigger than past, is to build a star team. I feel leaders who can build star teams high performance culture and, and where teams can really work very closely with each other, supporting each other, blending, bonding with each other, I think will win. Uh, this was a slogan 10 years, 20 years, 40 years back. This will continue to be a bigger issue because I feel that the teams now are very smart. They're all very well educated. They're all very young. The millennial generation where, uh, where they're very aware, they're very conscious of the profits and the purpose and many things which we were not aware when we started our career. I think building a star team out of that generation is a challenge. And if leaders can do it, then their performance of business will also be far superior. So these are the two major aspects where leaders will have to focus. Thank you. Before we close, uh, I'd like to ask uh, the panel here, right? One last question. If from all of what we've said, right, if there was one nugget of wisdom in 30 seconds that you can share with this next generation of leaders, what would that one nugget be? Romy, can I start with you, perhaps? Uh, this is one of those books, right? I mean, 10 rules to make a billion dollars. Okay. Um, I think, it, 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 in my opinion, it's got to be your attitude. Meaning, I, I define attitude as uh, being able to face whatever is thrown at you. Work, life, situations, you know, how you adapt to it. So if I'm given 30 seconds to kind of print my billion dollars as the, as the answer, uh, it would be adaptability uh, coupled with attitude. Uh, and that, that should kind of... That, that's something that has would be my uh, one one pointer uh, for the team. Thank you, Romy. And your point of view, your insights? I don't know. There's so many good insights here, and I'm glad you didn't put me on the spot first, but I'm still, I think um, I would have to say 
think about what you want to be known for, because since the topic of the conversation today is building your brand, think of something that comes naturally to you that doesn't come naturally to other people. Think about what you want to be known for and use that as your your trump card, as your secret superpower that um, you can pull out in any situation that will differentiate you from other people. So think about for you what that is. Brilliant. And I remember uh, when I was back in Singapore, walking on the street just before the office and seeing this poster that said, if you think about your legacy, is it a signature or your order? Right? So what's the legacy you're leaving behind? Or your what? The, the legacy was, what's your legacy? Is it a signature or an autograph, right? Are you putting your mind into it? Oh, uh, yeah. I think it was a brilliant, it was on a board, literally on the side of a road, right? That legacy is important, but how do you turn it from a signature to a um, uh, autograph? Anuj, uh, over to you. Uh, one nugget of wisdom. Uh, sorry to put you all in the spot with the one piece, but yes, Anuj. No, no, I'm not on the spot. I'm very clear that the autograph has to be your attitude, as Rumi said. There's nothing else which is more important. Attitude is your altitude. It is attitude which will make you win every time. A positive attitude, a glass half full, a positive spirit is always going to win. And I am noticing many youngsters uh, having it, but some youngsters are a bit cynic. So I will rec request uh, all the MBA students who are listening just to tell you that cynics don't win. So don't be a cynic, be positive, be optimistic, be hopeful. That's the way to win in life. Say, can I can I just, you know, there was a, I, I, I was penning down something and I written it for this team. Uh, for the MBA uh, colleagues. And it was about, you know, we don't need to wake up every day wanting to do one great thing. We can wake up every day to do many small things great every day. And I think that's a mantra that I think can, can be used in our life, uh, can be used in our relationships and can be used at work. You don't need to do that, you know, because all, all of us are under so much pressure to kind of hit that uh, 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 ball out of the park every day. That it, Life doesn't work like that. Wife is about those little ones, you know, the runs, the home bases only come once in a while. So whatever analogy you want to hit of cricket or baseball, you know, either you're hitting fours and sixes or you're hitting the ball out of the park, that doesn't happen every day. But what does happen every day is you're given a chance to win runs. You're given a chance to steal bases. And if you can keep doing that, those fours and sixes and out of the park balls will keep happening. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, listen, there's, there's one thing that comes to mind as we close this session, right? And I've, uh, you've heard some great wisdom from the, from the, from the team here, from the advisors. Um, I, I always think when I when I work with the MBA students, and, and I, it goes back to this uh, statement that I saw Roger Federer, who's a tennis player, made a couple of years ago. And he spoke about over the last decade of tennis, how Djokovic and Nadal playing with Federer, equally competition, right? I mean, really the most competitive environment in the world. But he compliments them for collectively bringing the game of tennis up 10 times. And he said, without that, our game would not have been where it is. So we have individual ideas, but I also think it's our responsibility as the next generation, generation of leaders, how do we pick up the entire ecosystem around us? And that's where I personally think you will differentiate yourself as you move forward. Listen, we have literally, we're at eight o'clock. I want to personally thank everybody for joining this. Personally, and you've been a great friend all along. Rumi, fantastic meeting you. Manoj, I cannot thank you enough for the mentorship over the last year. And thank you to all three of you for joining us. Thank you.